chance to chat with luminaries in e-discovery and related areas. Welcome to eDiscovery Leaders Live, hosted by ASETS and sponsored by Reveal. I am George Sosha, Senior Vice President of Brand Awareness at Reveal. Each Friday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern, I host an episode of eDiscovery Leaders Live, where I get the chance to chat with luminaries in luminaries in eDiscovery and related areas. Past episodes are available on the Reveal website. Go to revealdata.com, select resources, then select eDiscovery Leaders Live. My guest this week is Joseph Tate of Cozen O'Connor. Joe chairs the firm's eDiscovery and Practice Advisory Services Group, EPAS, or if I got the pronunciation wrong, Joe will get me right on that. He focuses his practice on eDiscovery, information governance, and data management issues in the context of litigation and investigations. Joe leads the firm's e-discovery efforts and is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of a team of attorneys and technologists that handle all phases of the e-discovery lifecycle. Joe manages complex e-discovery projects for high-profile matters involving various practice areas and industries, including higher education, financial services, construction, healthcare, and life sciences. He's well-versed in developing and implementing data mapping exercises, litigation hold and preservation plans, and organizing Forensa data collections. He also prepares and manages document review workflows using advanced technologies to cull and filter data sets, use advanced analytics to increase review efficiency, and implement quality control procedures to mitigate risk. Joe has extensive experience leading the e-discovery element of the meet and, of meet and confer conferences, preparing and negotiating ESI protocols, drafting and responding to discovery motions and requests, and taking and defending depositions of IT personnel and records managers. He also regularly counsels clients and colleagues on complex legal issues related to e-discovery, the attorney-client privilege and work product doctrine, information governance, and litigation readiness. If that weren't enough, Joe is also a member of leading e-discovery and information management organizations such as the Sedona Conference, Working Group One, ILTA, and ARMA. Joe also volunteers and provides pro bono legal services through Philadelphia VIP Community Legal Services and as a volunteer child advocate attorney with the Support Center for Child Advocates. He received his undergraduate degree from Boston University and his law degree from Villanova University School of Law. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. I appreciate the introduction. And there was a reason for the long introduction, <laughs> because we are going to be getting into uh, more than a little bit of that. That was a lengthy list. That's a lot of activities. There's a lot of expertise developed over time to get you there. But tell me, how did you get there? Where did you start? Uh, well, George, it, it kind of scares me to say this sometimes, but but I've been practicing law for, for just over 25 years now. and. Uh, I think I'm in denial about that, but but it is a fact. Um, I really started with my very first assignment out of law school. Um, I was handed a plane ticket and said, you're going to review our clients' hard copy documents for the next six months. Um, and, you know, that was at a time, mid-90s, um, really when corporations and, and the clients that, that the firm I was at at the time uh, were representing were transitioning from the paper world to, uh, to electronic and, and ESI, whether it's email or server data. So, um, you know, I spent the first couple of months as a lawyer sitting in a large room with tables and signing out bankers boxes full of documents and um, literally coding documents by hand and attaching 
you know, green for responsive. <laughs> I think we used pink for privilege. Um, so that was my introduction into, you know, large scale discovery and document review in particular. And I'd say seven, eight months into that process, um, a number of us were, were brought to a conference room and one of those kind of Price is Right moments, you know, the, the curtain is revealed and they said, uh, all of those boxes of documents have now been digitized and put into a, a database. And, you know, uh, it was likely one of the first, if not the first um, databases that, that we as e-discovery professionals use to, to review and code documents. Um, so that was my introduction. A little context there in terms of scope. How many boxes of documents were you dealing with at that point? Well, it seemed like a never ending flow, frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to give you a, a picture, we were, you know, it was a very sparsely, if, if at all, decorated office floor um, in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, it was a big, big room with boxes basically stacked floor to ceiling. Um, so hundreds, uh, hundreds is, a, is probably a fair estimation. And, the, and again, the, the flow never seemed to end. And these were your clients' documents, right? They were, yeah. So, so it, hopefully at least you weren't being put in a room that either had way too much air conditioning or way too much heating, not nearly enough light, no electricity, things like that. Well, I will say that because, you know, after that, I, I, I have, and probably you have too, did spend time in, in warehouses uh, that were not, uh, you know, climate controlled. So this was actually, you know, in hindsight, um, not too bad, but, you know, I definitely have experience, um, you know, in North Jersey in particular, sitting in a warehouse uh, with, with a coat on and gloves trying to review documents. That's and how we did it back then. And to help those who pine for the good old days they never actually experienced. My guess is that at least a few of these boxes had more than a bit of dust, grime, and perhaps uh, grease or oil on the top. And you might never quite know for sure what you were going to find when you opened up a box. That's a fair assumption, George. Yes. And, and we used to come up with some, some workarounds. We used to, you know, tape our fingers up so we didn't get paper cuts. Um, yeah. Not not the, the joys of the technology that we get to use today. So they took you aside. They You'd been surrounded by these thousands of boxes, millions of opportunities for paper cuts, and instead got put into a room with a computer terminal, something on the screen. What did it look like? Well, it doesn't look a lot, didn't look a lot like what we have today. Right. The user interface was very basic, um, primarily, you know, the, the metadata was, as we used to say, bibliographic coded, um, you know, entries, um, very rudimentary. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we were able to code the documents uh, appropriately. Um, I think the nicest thing was uh, we weren't getting on a plane every week um, so that we could do it from, you know, from from our offices in Philadelphia. and. You know, at the time, there were a number of national council firms involved, so we had all spent a lot of time together, so we got to go back to our respective offices. But, um, you know, at the time, it, it was pretty advanced, at least, you know, going from that that paper review world to, um, you know, to an electronic format, but nothing like what, what we all have on our fingertips today. Right. So you would have had the ability, I assume, to search for objective information dates of documents, names uh, of authors, perhaps things like that. Could you search the text of the documents at that point? Eventually. Now, early on, no. No. Mm -hmm. you were. I mean, it was still, um, you know, what we would call a linear review, right? It's right. just, you know, almost the equivalent of the hard copy review, but at least in a digital format at that point. And, and that system that you got placed in front of, was it advanced enough so that you could not just search the documents, but actually pull up images of documents on the screen? Or did you have to go somewhere else to find the, the documents themselves? No, it did have images. So that, that was a benefit. Yes. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it was a treat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm curious, did you have people almost immediately complain that it's, it took too long for them to see the image? 
Well, we never hear that today, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, of course. No, I think we were all so enamored with the technology that we frankly weren't many complaints. We were oh, just good. so happy that we were not handling paper anymore. But those were not the end times. Things changed from there. What happened next? Well, from a from a personal standpoint, as I kind of went through the associate ranks, um, you know, I moved a little bit away from the the review world and into more working on collections, custodial interviews. Um, I, I, at one point, I was on a joint defense privilege committee, so um, a little bit more substantive work, kind of packaging up the documents, if you will, for deposition prep. Um, and then interestingly, moved for a couple years where the e-discovery wasn't my primary focus, frankly, more of the traditional litigation associate role of taking depositions. Um, but I found over time, um, I just kept getting more calls and, and emails at that point from colleagues who were saying, hey, you've handled this e-discovery stuff before, haven't you? <laughs> and uh, I was... Uh, slowly, maybe not so slowly, um, dragged back into, you know, e-discovery all of the time. Um, and about 10 years into my career, you know, made a very conscious decision that um, this was the area of law that I was going to focus on and have done so for the past 15 or so years. When you were engaged in the more traditional litigation work, taking depth and defending depositions, for example, how much did your experience on the e-discovery side help inform and improve what you were doing in the depositions, if at all? Like one hundred percent did right, and and I think you know fundamentally, you know, litigation is the application of of a certain set of facts to the law, and what being involved in discovery at that level did to me would show me that whoever masters the facts the best is going to be the best prepared in a given piece of litigation. Um, and, you know, and for years I, I managed and trained, you know, large review teams. And I used to say to them, look, you know, you don't see document review on TV and, you know, we didn't go to law school to say we want to review documents, but the lawyers and the other paralegals, if you will, whoever's involved in that, you're on the front lines and you are invaluable to a case team or an investigative team if you can manage the facts. So what it did was teach me the importance of um, really mastering that part of a case. Um, without facts in your favor, um, you're not going to win and you, you, you better strategically start thinking of a way to resolve this matter. When you moved from paper to electronic, um, you were doing a largely linear workflow. You're probably not doing so much a linear workflow today, but my question goes to the linear part of it. How effective an approach was, or for that matter is, a linear review when what you're trying to do is find out what happened in the case and build the story you need to tell? And you're absolutely right. We do not do the types of linear reviews that we did in the past. Um, and I mean, that's one of the most exciting things about what, what we get to do in the e-discovery space is, um, I mean, and, and it really is, you know, it's one thing if your data set is not that large um, and you, know, you need to focus on a witness and you, know, you might want to, let, let's get everything sorted by, you know, this is after you know after you do a first pass review, you might tag documents for a particular witness. Well, then maybe it does make some sense um, to embark at least on a linear that smaller part of a linear review. But given the volumes of data that we deal with, and frankly the disparate data sources, um, and one of the biggest challenges um, is that you know email is not the only form of communication from a from a corporate level. So taking these various communications files, if you will, and, and meshing them all together um, is, is a challenge. And, and now we have at our fingertips 
um, you know, the tools, whether it's, um, you know, I mean, AI is a bit of a term I think is difficult to define. I mean, I think it's, it means different things for different people, but for those of us who, who leverage AI or machine learning in the discovery space, it's been invaluable, right? To, to get through 5 million documents um, in a linear review can cost millions and millions of dollars and take years, frankly. And those days are over. Those days are over. Um, and so we can quickly get into the data. Um, and this goes to really the workflows that we've set up over the past couple of years of whether you call it early case assessment and really digging in and seeing the types of concepts or the themes. Um, you know, I'm amazed. I, I had a call even just this week with a, a provider in the UK who has a fantastic application and what the tools can do now as far as recognizing you know opinion type thing and, and various um, you know themes within language um, it's tremendous it's tremendous one of the um, well before I go here let's let's do this you said linear review isn't so effective anymore. There are other approaches. Can you tell us a little bit about the approaches you find most effective these days? Well, I mean, there's there's been a lot of discussion over the past couple of years where people said search terms are dead, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I'm not of that opinion. I think that search terms can serve a very useful purpose in an initial cull, um, but we all know they're imperfect. Um, so whether, you know, we're leveraging, you know, and different providers call their, their applications different things, but at the end of the day, um, what I recommend to our case teams is getting folks involved to understand the technologies, understand the application, and instead of this desire to just jump in and run some search terms and start reviewing the documents, let's have a, a moment to pause. <laughs> let's think through what are the issues um, and then running the data through the various tools. And certain tools are better than others for a given case, um, whatever the data say may be. Maybe you're focusing more on mobile data or um, other you know, different types of data. Um, so you need to have at your fingertips the availability of different tools that will be that will serve you better. But really digging into that data and seeing what the tool is surfacing for you, which then will guide um, you know, the, the ultimate review workflow. I before um, concentrating my focus exclusively on e-discovery, I spent 16 years as a practicing lawyer, litigating cases, all the way from initial complaint through final appeal. In all those years, I encountered really one case with a smoking gun. Everything else was an accretion of details. I continue to hear people talk about how you can do this to find the smoking gun, do that to find the smoking gun, from my perspective, it was about building up layer after layer after layer of detail until you were able to put a story together. What's your experience been with all of this and, and what approaches and tools help you whichever way you're dealing with it? Well, I have found a smoking gun <laughs> on, on more than one occasion, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but you're exactly right. It is about building the story. It's about taking again, the facts, and, and as we see today, the facts are everywhere. They're in all sorts of disparate data sources. Um, I mean, a recent example, um, you know, trying to, we were in, involved in investigation and, you know, person A sends an email at a certain time. Well, did they also send a text at a contemporaneous time? And then do we also need to look at their call logs to see what they were doing at that time? And, and that's exactly the point of building the story, building the narrative. What are the facts telling you? Um, and you're right. I mean, over my career, maybe a handful of smoking guns, but it really is about the narrative, about telling the story, 
um, either to win your case or to inform you that maybe you have some weaknesses in your case. Um, and, and it's, I feel like I don't get, I, I really love rolling up my sleeves and getting involved in the data and digging in. And, and it's unfortunate that I don't get to do it as much as I would like anymore. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I seem to manage more people doing it. Um, but that's such, to me, a really exciting part of what we do is what is the data telling you? What are the documents saying? Um, does it contradict what your client has told you? Um, you know, do the the allegations in a complaint, are they truly supported by the facts? Um, which also goes not to a forgotten piece, but um, the challenges of re reviewing inbound productions. You know, it's 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 much easier when you have the native data, you process it, it gets into your tools. Um, but then making sure that when you're negotiating with the other side, you're getting the data in a format that's going to allow you to leverage those same tools on the documents you receive from the other side. But I agree 100 percent. It's it's more the story than the smoking gun. Right. There is a pers there is a persistent perception that what we do in the e-discovery trenches, whatever it is, it's not the practice of law. We don't get to hold ourselves out for the most part as e-discovery specialists the way we could hold ourselves out as, say, trial specialists. What do you think about that perception? Well, I'm obviously very biased. <laughs> um, I absolutely 100% believe it's the practice of law. I mean, everything we do, and I and, and I see this happen, um, right? So there's the, the, the collection, the processing, the production of data, um, and people see that as a commodity almost, and there's data charges around it. Um, but I regularly meet with my team, and I, and I manage lawyers, and I manage non-lawyers, project managers and technologists, we call them. And periodically throughout the year, I'll do a refresher in e-discovery 101, and it's this kind of recurring PowerPoint I have is why we do what we do. Everything we do, especially in litigation, is dictated by the rules of civil procedure and the rules of evidence, the law, right? So, you know, when I'm counseling a, a colleague about production format, right? No, you don't want to enter on joint stipulation to convert 10,000 emails to PDF, because how are you going to authenticate that at trial? Um, how are you going to use it as an exhibit at a deposition? Um, so obviously the rules of evidence are law. We need to make sure that as we collect, process, and produce data, that we're laying the, the runway, if you will, because that's a piece of evidence that ultimately needs to be authenticated um, and potentially used as, a, as an exhibit in trial. Um, and if you can't authenticate that, if you haven't followed um, all the requisite steps, that motion in limine gets filed and, and you're in trouble. Um, and the same thing with the rules of civil procedure. That's what we do. I mean, I, when I get calls from colleagues, and this is not unique to my firm, the first two questions I ask are, what jurisdiction are you in and what's the amount in controversy? And then I say, all right, well, you're in the Northern District of California. Let's see what the particular judge does, all governed by the law. And then we wanna know, you know, if you have a, you know, $5 million at stake versus 500 million, that's going to um, color the way we might approach things from a pr proportionality standpoint. You mentioned earlier in the discussion, and I think I've got the, the uh, tense correct, that you used to manage large teams of reviewers. Are there still large teams of reviewers out there in your organization and someone else is managing them? Do you have a better way of doing things? What's happening these days? So, I mean, this is going back 10 years where, where we didn't have you know, the types of applications that we do today. And it was, as we were talking about, more of a linear review. Um, and, you know, at the time, I mean, I, I, I recall quite clearly having multiple teams of 50 plus contract attorney review teams 
pouring through documents. Today, we just don't need to do that. I can, I can get through the same volumes um, with less people and in less time. Um, which is why it's incumbent upon us, and, you know, I spend a lot of time, and this is what I say to the folks um, on my team, is you need to be fluent and up to speed in, in the latest technological tools that are out there, right? Because they have changed and are evolving all of the time. And that's what I find so exciting about what we do. I mean, I can recall where email threading was not a thing, right? And I can recall where, you know, we'd collect mobile data and we'd pour through UFED reports and basically, you know, an Excel format. We don't do that anymore. Um, so, you know, I remember having teams literally reviewing about 900,000 text messages. And this was before we had the types of tools and not, it wasn't that long ago. Um, and now the way we can, you know, ingest it and review it, it's just so much more efficient. Um, than it was. So are those days over? No, I mean, I think there's still second request work in particular that's going to require um, a lot of reviewers. Um, but it, it personally, and, and the way we deal with it, we just don't have those types of teams anymore. We don't, we don't see the need because you know, that we can quickly address those volumes um, much more efficiently. At the uh, beginning of this discussion, before you came on, I went through a lengthy description of the various areas you work in, the skills you've developed, the expertise you now can bring to bear. My guess is that you have people coming to you, at least from time to time, asking some version of, how can I be you? How can I get to where you are? What, what's your advice for those people? Well, I, I, and I don't think this is unique to what we do, but, but any profession or job, you just have to be passionate about it. And you find that subject matter, um, you know, that really gets you up in the morning, right? I, I'm a bit of a tech wonk. You know, I don't have a, a, you know, although a lot of my colleagues over the years come from more of a programming or an IT related background, I don't, but, but, but I love technology. And, and frankly, I love being a lawyer. Um, and I think you know, there's no, there's really no shortcuts. It requires time. And so for me, every morning I get up and I, I probably have anywhere from eight to 10 emails from e-discovery blogs or case law updates. And so pre-pandemic, when I rode the train, <laughs> I would flip through those. And, and that's something that you have to do every single day in our space because everything is changing. And it's not just the technology that we get to use, you know, kind of in our sandbox, right? The toys that we get to play with, but educating yourself on what the clients are using from a technology standpoint. Um, you know, it's, it's fun, you know, so we, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about Slack. Um, you know, if I'm going to advise a client on best practices around Slack, well, I've got to know it, right? And and that's that's time I have to to carve out to teach myself about it. So it's this kind of continuous state of learning. Um, and when you're passionate about it, it, it's it's fun. It's fun. So from what I'm hearing, to use an analogy, we're not talking to develop and maintain these skills about a sprint or a relay. This is at least a marathon, if not an ultra marathon, no? And I'm a runner, so I think that analogy works very well, right? You, you, you know, your times are not gonna drop in a marathon unless you're putting in the time. And that's really what it is. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think, you know, it's just what I find most challenging is, or not challenging, but interesting that keeps me going is that every individual matter we handle, you know, is it poses a different challenge, right? We all kind of have our playbook, right? Which, which was the EDRM, which was the greatest thing that came about, but here's a visualization of what we do. But there's so many nuances to everything, right? So just in the past week, you know, 
collecting from Slack? What are we doing with JSON files, right? And then on the flip side, just two days ago, a colleague called me and said, the client uses Lotus Notes. We have NSF files. And I said, oh, geez, I, <laughs> that's an old one for me. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, I had handled a case, you know, eight to 10 years ago. And so I could, you know, pull that out, out of the hat and say, well, this is what we need to do. Um, you know, I, people ask me, well, you know, what is Lotus Notes? Is it email? I'm like, well, it's kind of. <laughs> um, right. So again, it's, it's having to understand technology and just having that enthusiasm to learn about it all of the time. Great. And keeping your hand up. That's what I say to folks on my team. Always keep your hand up. Someone asks a question, raise your hand, you will figure out the answer. And that's one of the benefits of a, of a legal training in my mind is we will find the answer. Might take a little while, but we will get it. Great, well, thank you very much, Joe, for joining us today. Joe Tate is chair of the eDiscovery and Practice Advisory Services Group. And what's the proper pronunciation of the acronym? It's EPASS, e EPASS. E okay. <laughs> So Jay, Jay, Joe is, is the chair of EPAS at Cozen O'Connor. I am George Sosha. This has been eDiscovery Leaders Live, hosted by ACEDS and sponsored by Reveal. Thank you all for joining us today, and please join us again next Friday, May 21st, when our guest will be Ricky Bruman of Saul Uig. Joe, thank you very much. Thank you, George. My pleasure.